Hey, hey, be quiet. Good grief. Hello, lovely people. Welcome back to the farm. Today I'm going to tell you about the top 10 embarrassing lessons that we learned the hard way as first time homesteaders. We've made some, uh, some pretty solid advances. We've had some great successes, but anytime you're doing something, you're going to fail. You're going to fail at least once when you do so many different things. They're not failures. They're really just the cost of education. That's how I look at it. You're going to pay for education one way or the other. I'm just going to share with you what we in our situation and from our own experience actually learned this year on our new homestead. What I would tell you is that everybody's situation is different. Everybody's experience is different. Everybody's risk tolerance is different. Your situation may not look like ours. That's fine. Maybe some of these things are things that you've already learned or that you, um, you think is just common sense, everyday kind of stuff. Well, that's great for you. That's what it is for us. It was, this is what it was. So as embarrassing as some of these things are to me to admit, you know, as a man to go, Hey, yeah, I messed up here. That's not easy for me to do. So I'm kind of putting myself out there. And that's one of the things I've found is interesting in life is when you go and you get advice from people, the last thing anybody wants to share, it seems are what not to do. Um, there's been a lot of situations in my life where I'm like, so what would you have done differently? You know, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you made? That's how I, I want to learn from other people's mistakes. So I don't have to repeat the same mistakes. Uh, the very first thing that I'll let you know right off the bat, the number one lesson that we learned is that getting into this, this lifestyle, it can be very expensive. Now I say it can be because it doesn't have to be. Uh, it just depends on if you're willing to be a little more patient, wait for a good deal. It just depends on if you're willing to uh, put more time into something rather than pay for something to happen more quickly. I mean, there's all these different variables. So I'll just put this out there that for us in our situation, at the speed that we wanted to do things, I wasn't anticipating how expensive some of this stuff could be to get into. So that's, uh, that's something to consider. All right. The next big lesson learned as I'm standing here right next to it, we've got this temporary fencing here. I'm not going to touch cause it's on, but right here, this temporary fencing at our scale, of what we're doing, it does not replace the permanent electric fence. So the reason that temporary fencing can't replace the permanent electric fence around the property for our scale is that it just takes so much time and so many hours of labor to move that stuff. Because if you've got some temporary fencing, the idea is you're moving it. You're moving it to rotate your animals as they graze down an area. You want to move them to another area. That's given you a lot of, a lot more work. We did that for most of the season, most of the, the grazing season, we just did temporary fencing and uh, we were just exhausting ourselves. I know some people do that. Maybe people that they homestead for a living and that's fine. But going out there, having to get out there like every other day and move 400 feet of fence is not fun. It's a lot of work. And so for us in our context, from my own experience, getting this permanent electric fence installed, the semi-permanent electric fence installed, that's the bee's knees, man. Like that took so much work off our, our plates near the end there. And that's time that we could be spending creating video content or doing stuff with the kids and doing more stuff with the animals, getting more animals. I don't know. You know, this is about three plus acres here of pasture behind me. And we've got an, almost another acre on the other side. When you're at that scale and you've got this many animals and you're moving them, you know, every day or every other day, that can really save you a lot of time to have a permanent fence so that you're just moving one or two lines every, every day or every other day. The temporary fencing was a good way to get us introduced to electric fencing and, and we'll continue to use the electric fencing. I'm not saying that we won't use it. We will, but it's going to be something that we, we substitute 
that, or we use it just for the chickens, just for the, the ducks, something like that. Oh, they are eating out of the, the hay there. You just love to eat, yes. Oh, so yummy, so yummy. The uh, pigs absolutely adore butternut squash. They'll be out here for the next hour cleaning up every little last scrap, every last little seed. Um, but they just love this stuff. So they're getting a special treat today. Lesson number three. Now this is a doozy. This is uh, this one's embarrassing. Sprinklers are far better at irrigation than a sprayer is. When we had the drought, as you know, we had this severe drought in our area of the country last year. I knew that we should probably try to start getting water out to our pastures so that they they would continue to grow and they wouldn't die on us. I get this brand new sprayer because, you know, it's all organic around here. And uh, I didn't want to risk having a used sprayer that somebody had put, uh, you know, glyphosate or something like that in it, otherwise known as Roundup. Getting a brand new sprayer for the, for the tractor, hooking it all up, getting, you know, taking the time to get it all connected up and filled with water. And then I found out that it took about three tanks of water to do one acre. And I don't know that I was even getting enough water to saturate the ground, but I would get out there at night when it cooled off and start spraying and just looking at the ground and the amount of water that I was putting out, I don't think it was anywhere near enough. I ended up going to Baumgars and getting some sprinklers. And that's when I felt really, really stupid, like bonehead stupid because I saw the difference in the amount of water that a sprinkler put out. Not to mention the fact that I don't have to be out there running the sprinkler, <laughs> driving a sprinkler around. The sprinkler stands in one spot and every, you know, once in a while you run out there and you put the sprinkler in a different spot, putting down several inches of water then. And we were just, we were just soaking the pastures. They were getting plenty of water and we got some really, really amazing growth. So yeah, pretty embarrassing. Number four lesson learned is that animals' feed and water needs can sneak up on you. Um, there were a couple of times where I didn't realize we were almost out of food and we had a couple of days of food left. It could have been avoided if we had simply uh, been keeping up on the feed needs. Now the other thing was the water. Uh, we didn't. We had plenty of water for our chickens over the summer, but our Cornish cross, and I guess they're notorious for this. I just didn't think it would happen here to us but they are notorious for even with full chicken nipple waterers um, and a full tank that they can get water from they will not stand up and go over there and get their water so you have to put dishes or pans of water out for them so that they'll actually drink otherwise they can get heat stroke and, and uh, just oh yeah they can die really fast we lost 12 chickens. We lost a dozen chickens in one day. It's not like we didn't have water for them, but they needed special uh, watering care that day. And uh, that was also the first, or it was the first or the second day that I was starting to feel really ill during the summer. Pay attention to temperature and know your animals. So growing up out in the country and growing up on a farm are two completely different things. You can grow up in a, out in the country and you can you know, live that country life. If you've not lived on a farm like I haven't, I learned that you just don't know things that you don't even know. Lesson number five, never buy something from an auction sight unseen. There were still two big mistakes that I made with running gears. With a running gear, but more so with an auction, an online auction, you know? So this last year was the rise of the online auction. And there were, so there were tons of places that were doing nothing but these kind of sight unseen online only auctions. I mean, you were able to come out and look at the stuff, but sometimes it was so far away that you didn't really want to. So we got some good deals on some stuff. We did find some stuff that we needed and you know, we didn't have to pay new prices for it. Then there was this one auction near the end where I was tired of going to these auctions. I was tired of going the day before to look at something that I then had to remember to bid on the next day. So I was just on there and I was looking at it and they were selling a lot of uh, really nice looking running gears. I win this running gear. I go that day to pay for it and pick it up thinking I'm going to pull it back. Well, unfortunately, uh, the thing was so seized up and so rusted that it was only good for scrap. Uh, that was a hard lesson to learn, mostly because of the time. 
of just driving out there and then having to drive back knowing that I had made such a big mistake. Lesson number six, running gears are not built to travel at high speeds. Now I've heard people say that, oh, you can pull a running gear down the, the freeway at 70 miles per hour. Yeah, maybe unloaded, but you're not gonna be pulling that thing when it's filled with five, six tons of, of feed on it or hay on the back of it. You're not gonna be pulling it that fast. About the optimal towing speed for that thing is 20 miles per hour. Ultimately what happened is that turned a one and three quarter hour drive into about a six hour drive back. And that was unexpected. Lesson number seven. There's more than one way to skin a lamb or pluck a chicken. I had, uh, I had found a method to skin a lamb and I had found a method to pluck a chicken. And uh, it was only through a lot of time, a lot of uh, actually skinning lambs and actually plucking chickens that I learned that there are better ways to do it. The general lesson is don't get so tied down to one way of doing something that you can't even consider a, a, another way. All right, to finish up here, we've got three more lessons learned. Um, number eight, don't count your chickens before you've raised a few. And what I mean by that is you'll be surprised how much food, how much feed chickens eat as they're growing. Once they reach maturity, they eat a little less, but as they're growing, they need a lot more, especially meat chickens. They will. There's a reason that the Cornish cross are called sea monsters. You know, they grow very quickly, they eat a ton of food. We had probably, I don't know, three tons of feed to feed all of our chickens this year, maybe even more. Don't count your chickens, which basically what I'm saying is I was calculating how many chickens we'd be able to handle raising. And we did fine, it was okay. We did have some friends that came and kind of bailed us out during um, some of the, the butchering days and whatnot. But, uh, you know, and then we finally did get faster at butchering and we had our technique down and then we were really we were really running through chickens. You know, we did the 77 chickens in a single day. We butchered all by, by ourselves, just my wife and I. Maybe we did have the kids helping too. But, so we did get faster. We did get a system down and, and, and got a technique down and we got better at it. But at first, I wish we hadn't started with so many chickens. You know, I, I don't know what we're gonna do. We still have to talk about that. We still have to figure out for our needs, for our purposes, what do we need to do? We might not need to, you know, raise any meat chickens next year because we've got freezers full of meat which is really good. Start out with a more manageable number and 350 chickens in a single year if you haven't raised them in several years. We, it's not that I've never raised chickens, but you just don't remember how bad it can be until you do it again. So, so number nine, there is safety and an abundance of counselors. You might recognize that from uh, the sayings of a wise man. You know, get guidance, get counsel, seek many advisors. Uh, otherwise plans will fail, you won't have victory, you won't win, things will go badly for you. Basically what this amounts to is, uh, you know, it's not that we didn't get guidance and we didn't get uh, advice. I just know that sometimes the advice I was getting was after the fact and I was going, boy, that could have saved me a lot of time. You know, you can get counsel from YouTube, you can get counsel from uh, the internet, you know, go and do an internet search for, for things and read forums and read other people's posts and stuff on how they did it and what their experiences were. And the more information that you get and you can accumulate, the better chance you will find somebody that has a situation closer to yours and, and has uh, a need to apply certain techniques or certain strategies to the situation that they have that it's going to be similar enough to yours that you're going to then be able to apply that to your situation. Um, and so, and, and also if you have friends or family or just acquaintances that can guide you or direct you, never underestimate that, you know, uh, that is worth so much. And then, you know, friends who will actually come over and they'll, they'll actually demonstrate it for you, that's priceless. Lesson number 10 of lessons learned this year is buy a tractor early, which I did, wait for the second part to drop and get a snowblower for it. I didn't get a snowblower for it because I had a bucket and I thought, I'm going to plow my driveway with a bucket. Oh no, you're not. So this may not apply to a lot of people. You know, you may be like, I don't even need a tractor. This doesn't help me at all. Well, I found that this year I really could have used a snowblower. We haven't had too much snow yet, but guess what, guess what I called and bought or got ordered from the tractor store, <laughs> the tractor dealer, 
uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago. I got a three-point snowblower. So I'm going to have a snowblower in the back of my tractor this winter, hopefully yet this winter. Now, it, that's the other thing too, is buy the snowblower early. Don't wait until you need it. I didn't know I was going to need it. I didn't think I was going to need it. After getting out there and clearing my driveway with the bucket, I found out that I don't like clearing snow for three hours when I probably could have done it a lot quicker with a snowblower. These 10 lessons that I'm talking about us learning, uh, yeah, some of them are, some of them kind of still sting a little bit. Ultimately, you know, you just got to realize, and what I'm trying to remind myself of is that these are lessons learned. That's pretty much it. Uh, sometimes you're just not going to avoid things, but you, it doesn't mean that you got to repeat the same thing twice. You can learn from it, move on. That's about all the uh, time we have for today. I hope that helps. Maybe uh, you can be entertained by uh, our misfortune. Other than that, I just want to say thanks for watching, and we'll see you again tomorrow.